At Ledgewood Baptist Church family and friends, thank you again for joining us this morning as we continue to walk through the stories of Scripture, looking at what Jesus did during his last earthly week, um, Holy Week. Uh, this started off with Palm Sunday last Sunday and will culminate in Resurrection Sunday or Easter, which is coming up just three days from now. Um, and so we are right there uh, towards the end in one of the two most pivotal days in all of human history, in all of eternity, Good Friday, um, the day that Jesus went to the cross. And so I just want to be honest with you. Uh, today doesn't feel very much like a Good Friday. It doesn't feel like a traditional Good Friday. It doesn't feel like a normal Good Friday. I don't know that it even feels like a good Friday. Uh, but the truth is, is that this morning, as I crossed over the church property and I looked, and I see the cross still currently holding the purple cloth, which will change over to black, symbolizing the death that Jesus died here a little bit later this afternoon. It reminded me that regardless of my feelings or what today feels like, uh, the truth is, is that it was Good Friday 2,000 years ago on this day. And today is a day that we celebrate the fact that Jesus did, in fact, die on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And so despite how I feel or what's going on, or how unnormal things are, anything else that's happening around us, the good news is great news. And Jesus did bear the cross, bear the nails and the thorns, and everything else that he took, and drink fully of the cup of wrath, so that my sins and your sins can be forgiven. And so looking at this story today, this comes again from all four gospel accounts. I specifically lean on Matthew, just because that's the one I prefer. And so Matthew chapter 27 uh, just kind of this whole story, it's the same, and all of them add in some extra details. And so I just want to walk through the story, looking at what happened with Jesus and to Jesus on that day, and then just wrap up with three quick little thoughts. And so we know that yesterday, being Monday, Thursday, that a lot happened to Jesus and around Jesus. Uh, Jesus was, after praying in the garden that night and asking, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. But Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And clearly, the Father's will was that Jesus had to drink the cup of his wrath so that he could offer to us the cup of salvation. And so Jesus stood up prepared and ready to fulfill his mission. His mission was to come and save those that were lost by taking death upon himself. He goes and he meets his betrayer Judas face to face. The high priest and the other religious leaders and the soldiers that are there take Jesus in in the middle of a sham trial by night. They mock him, they beat him, they spit on him, uh, they lie about him, um, and they imprison him for the evening. And very early in the morning the next day when the sun rises with the beginning of the day, we see that they are bloodthirsty and they're ready to get this thing going because they've asked Jesus, are you the son of God? And Jesus, not being a liar, said, yes, I am the son of God. I am God. And you will see me rise to the, my righteous place, which is at the right hand of the Father. And at that point, they would not be satisfied with normal punishment. They would not be satisfied with silence. They wanted Jesus dead. And so they were bloodthirsty, and they woke early in the morning and took Jesus to the Roman governor, to Pilate. And so there's this back and forth between Pilate and Herod, and they go back and forth trying to figure out who is going to do this or who's going to do what. They're both very intrigued by the idea of Jesus. They're both very intrigued by what's going on. And eventually we see there that Jesus ends up with Pilate. And the whole time between Pilate and Herod, they're telling them these accusations that the Jewish people have for them. They're saying this about you. They're saying this about you. But again, like a lamb led to a slaughter, slaughter, Jesus remains silent. He refuses to answer those lies or those accusations because regardless of those things, Jesus knew the cross was coming. He knew the cross was required and he was headed to that place. And then standing there privately with Pilate, finally a question comes that Jesus does answer. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, yes, I am him. I am who I am. I am the king of the Jews. And so Pilate sin, walks out with Jesus there, and Jesus is already looking battered and bruised because what he's received the night before, surely he got no rest that night. And so he walks out, and he's there with Pilate, and Pilate looks down, and it's the tradition that they release a prisoner on this day. And so Pilate says, who do you want, Jesus, the king of the Jews, or do you want Barabbas, a known murderer in prison for murder? And the people start to cry out, Barabbas, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And so Pilate is kind of surprised and shocked at this point. He says, well, what do I do with him? What do I do with Jesus, this innocent man? And they said, crucify him, kill him, take him to the cross. 
And so Pilate dips his hands in a bowl and he washes his hands and says, let his blood be on your heads. And he sends him away with soldiers. Now the soldiers first, before they take Jesus on, they take him into the praetorium. They're into a private place and they surround around him. They strip him down of all of his clothes and they make a mockery of him. They put a fake king's robe on him, a piece of purple cloth. They put a crown of thorns on his head and crush it down to where it pierces his skull. They put a stick, a reed in his hand, and they beat him with it. They spit in his face. They, they have a faux worship ceremony where they say, Oh, hell, king of the Jews, just messing with him, being so hateful and cruel. They march him out. They scourge him, meaning that they take a whip that has pieces of bone and iron and rock, and they whip his back repeatedly with it, ripping his flesh away from the bone. Again, putting the purple robe back on him that's going to dry into the blood. They march him out in front of the people, and they say, Behold, look, King of the Jews. And it angers the people, and that was the point. And now you have this bloodthirsty crowd, this mocking crowd, and they say, Crucify him, crucify him. And so they now take that robe that's now dried in the blood, and they rip it painfully off of Jesus' flesh. They put his clothes back on him, and he begins his march to Golgotha, to the place of the skulls, a rock and a mountain that looks like a skull. Jesus is so battered and bruised and so weak at this point that he cannot even carry his own cross. And so we see a man named Simon of Cyrene come in and carries Jesus' cross. He gets to the top of the hill. The cross is dropped. Jesus is laid on top of this cross. Again, everything removed from him. He had a robe on him. They removed his clothes. Eventually they would gamble for these clothes and they would cast dice for these clothes. And they lay Jesus on the cross with the crown of thorns still on his head. And they take nails, rusty iron railroad type nails, and they nail him through his wrist, they nail him through his feet, and they stand him up and they hang him on a cross and hang the cross right there between the cross of two sinners, two thieves, to fulfill another prophecy. So many prophecies being fulfilled during this time that it says that he would be hung among the transgressors. And so he's hung there with two thieves. People walk by the cross that day. And they say, if you're really God, then bring yourself down. If you can heal other people, then heal yourself. If you can save them, then save yourself. And Jesus looks at them with great pity in his heart. And he cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. One of the thieves on one of the sides and said, if you really are you who you are, then get us off this cross. Get yourself down, and get us down to mocking him and cursing him and saying all kinds of wicked things to him. However, the, cross on, the, the thief on the other cross on the other side said, Shut your mouth. We've gotten what we deserve, but this man's done no wrong. And he looks at Jesus, and Jesus looks back at him, and he says, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus looks back at that man, and he says, Son, today I promise you, you will be with me in paradise. And it says from noon to three o'clock in the afternoon that this great darkness falls over the land. There's a spiritual darkness. Now there's a physical darkness. And at three o'clock, Jesus cries out in Hebrew, but the translation is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Pronouncing the words of Psalm 22. And if you have not read Psalm 22, go read that, which was written hundreds of years before Jesus hung on the cross, again, fulfilling a prophecy of what was happening that day. So he pronounces, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And with one final breath there at three o'clock, Jesus cries out, It is finished. He came to do the work that was necessary for the forgiveness of sins. He has completed his mission. It is finished. And Jesus drops his head. The Bible says he gives up his spirit and he dies. Shortly after that, the religious leaders who are so concerned with keeping right faith, so concerned with religion, they go to the soldiers and they say, we've got to get these men off the cross because it's against the law for there to be death around us so that we can have a right Sabbath. How ridiculous. And so the soldiers go and they take a club and they go to the first thief and they, they break his knees, they break his legs so that he has to slump and he'll die quicker. They go to the other thief and they break his knees, they break his legs so they have to slump quicker and die quicker so they can get about their little faux religious ceremonies, pretend the Sabbath, and they go to Jesus. And Jesus is already dead, so there's no need to break his bones. So instead, they take a spear and they pierce his side, again, fulfilling two more prophecies because Jesus fulfills 
all of them. And it says, at that time, great things happened across the land. There's this great earthquake that takes place, and tombs are opened up, and the, the dead come alive, and they go throughout the city seeing other people, and that there's a guard up top, there's a soldier at the top that says, truly, this man was the Son of God. And before the dark came, so before the day ended and the new day began, before dark happened, the disciples came. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who had become one of the disciples of Jesus, came. And they said, can we have his body? Can we at least have his body to take him down and to give him a right burial? And so the soldiers give them the okay. They take him down. They clean up his body. And they take a linen cloth and they wrap him in the death burial shroud. They wrap him up. They put him in a tomb that had never been used. Joseph's own tomb. They put him in there. They cover him up. And they roll the tomb over a roll of rock, a huge stone over the cover of the tomb. And Jesus is entombed before the dark ever happens, before the day ends. Day number one. As I think about all that takes place on Good Friday, and I think about all the mocking voices and all the things that happened and that Jesus heard and the things he heard slung at him from the mouths of so many different people that day, Reminded of one of the first Christian songs that I ever heard. My mom used to sing this song and shared this song with me when I was a little boy. And it's how deep the Father's love for us. And the second, the second verse of that song says, Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. And the truth is, is that among all those voices crying out, Crucify him! Crucify him! calling for Jesus' death, hanging Jesus on that cross. My voice and your voice are one of those voices that were crying out for that because of our rebellion and our sin against the Lord. And so I want to wrap up with this. That looking at three different people, three different examples, we only have three possible responses when it comes to Jesus on this Good Friday. And really, Jesus, the responses to Jesus in our life. And this is it. The first one is we can be like Judas. Now, I didn't tell what happened to Judas on this day, but Judas was the betrayer. He had sold Jesus over for 30 pieces of silver. And so he came back on this day as the morning, as they run to take Jesus to Pilate and to Herod. The Jewish leaders are there. The religious leaders are there. And Judas, overcome by guilt, Satan has long since left him at this point, and overcome by guilt, Judas goes in and he throws the money down. He says, I, I wish I hadn't done it. He just, But he runs back to religion. He does not run back to repentance. He does not run to Jesus. He runs back to religion. And religion's response to him is, what has that got to do with us? You see, religion always makes you feel guilty. But it can never lead to salvation. It can never lead to hope. And so Judas, running back to those religious leaders saying, what have I done? looking for some sort of answer. And religion's answer to Judas is, what's that got to do with me? So one option is we can take the religious answer, trying to find an answer, but there is no hope there. The second one is we can try the Pilate answer. Pilate attempted to wash himself of guilt. He says there that I'm not guilty of this man's blood. That's on you. And he washed his hands very pontiously, very pridefully. Pontius Pilate. And he says, I'm innocent of this blood. But that was not true. Pontius was just as guilty. He too had been warned that this was a righteous man. His wife had come to him and said, have no part with this. There's nothing wrong with this man. This man has done nothing wrong. Pontius' own words were, this man is righteous. What would you have me to do with this righteous man? And instead he tries to cleanse his own hands, trying to make himself innocent. But us doing our own works to cleanse ourselves still leaves us guilty. The Bible tells us that we have not been saved by our works, not even our righteous works. The Old Testament tells us our righteous works are as filthy rags. We cannot cleanse ourselves. So option number two, you can try to cleanse yourself by being good, by being kind, by doing all the right things. But yet still, that's just filthy rags in the eyes of the Father. And so we come to the last solution, the third option, and that's the one of the thief on the cross. We come in him and we look at Jesus and we said, Lord, remember me. And we cry out to Jesus. And what we allow to happen is we allow Jesus to speak for us. And Jesus looked back at the thief on the cross that day and he said, my son, I promise you today you will be with me in paradise 
Because this man cried out to Jesus and begged for forgiveness, he allowed Jesus' words to speak for him, and he was promised eternal life. So in your life and in my life, and on this Good Friday, we again are forced with the decision. And maybe you've made this decision before, but I don't want to assume that. And so you have one of three options. You can bow the knee to religion, and there is no hope there. You can bow the knee to self-righteousness, good works. There is only condemnation found there. Or you can bow the knee to Jesus, and you can let Jesus speak for you. The Bible says that it is destined for every man to die once and then to face the judgment, meaning that we will all stand before a judge, and the judge of all things is Jesus. He will judge every person. And so will you have Jesus speak for you and say, I knew you. I forgave you because you depended on me. You placed your life and your soul in my hands. Rise, and I today, you will enter into paradise with me. So which option do you choose? Good Friday is a great day to narrow that down and to nail that down. Today is the day that Jesus went to the cross, and it's day one of Jesus entering the tomb. And I pray that today you aren't lost on the value and the beauty and the agony and all the necessary things that took place so that our sins might be forgiven. Guys, thank you so much for opening up this painful, painful story of what had to take place so that we could walk in eternal life and be filled with hope and peace. Tomorrow we look back at day number two in the tomb. What happened in the tomb? What was going on? What did what took place on that day? I hope that you'll join me again, guys. I love you so much. Tonight on Facebook Live again for the church at 7 p.m. We'll be having the Lord's Supper again, remembering the new covenant that was ushered in on this day as Jesus went to the cross. Guys, thank you so much for your time. I'm praying for you. Please continue to pray that the Lord would open our eyes to the true beauty of what happened on Good Friday. I'll see you tonight, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Bye.